Good afternoon, everybody. I think we'll go ahead and get started. So greetings to everybody in the room and to everyone online. Um, and welcome to Yale Cancer Center Grand Rounds. My name is Pam Coons. I'm the director of the Center for GI Cancers, for those of you who do not know me. And it is a great honor to introduce my friend, Dr. James Yao, as the Norbert Schnog Endowed Lecturer. So Dr. Yao is a professor and chair in the Department of GI Medical Oncology at the University of MD Anderson Cancer Center. And he received his medical degree from Baylor College of Medicine and completed his fellowship um, at MD Anderson. So over the last two decades, Dr. Yao and colleagues have really transformed the field of neuroendocrine tumors. So that is how I know him. And he has led practice-changing randomized clinical trials, specifically the family of radiant clinical trials that include the drug Everolimus that led to FDA approvals for pancreatic net, lung net, and GI neuroendocrine tumors. Dr. Yao is also a strong advocate of mentoring and education. He is a founding member and past chairman of the North American Neuroendocrine Tumor Society, of which I am the president of this year. I mean, through that society, he helped establish two young investigator awards that fund early career investigators. He's also the past chair of the NCI Neuroendocrine Tumor Task Force. And during his tenure, early career and female investigators led more than 50% of the multi-centered clinical trials developed through that net task force. Um, I've known Dr. Yao since I was a fellow. Um, I am one of those early career investigators who benefited from his mentorship and scholarship and had the opportunity to lead one of the randomized trials through the NET task force. So I'm grateful for you coming today and joining us to speak on the second century of the land of small tumors. So thank you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction and uh, very glad to be here with you today. So today I'm gonna talk a little bit about neuroendocrine tumors. Um, where we've been and some of the challenge uh, remains and for you know what we need to make the uh, next uh, century even better than the uh, what we've done so far. Um, and as a plug for Nanets, uh, this uh, this rainbow and this photograph was from one of the Nanets meetings, which we held at uh, um, at uh, the Grand Tetons National Park. And um, let's see. Here's my disclosures. So the field of neuroendocrine tumors started with Obendorfer, who first described this entity about uh, in, in 1907. He described this group of disease as cancer-like or part, uh, with tumors that are more slow growing than the typical carcinomas. The first century of NET has been a, a century where we've learned a lot about the natural history of the disease understand a lot of the endocrine manifestations of neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, we also learn a lot about epidemiology of disease and smastan biology. However, the number of therapeutic introduced uh, over this period is actually relatively sparse. Uh, prior to, um, I would say the more recent approvals, there was only one drug that was FDA approved for oncologic control and that's streptozocin for pancreatic net. There were two drugs uh, approved for hormonal control of the neuroendocrine uh, tumors. This is certainly not for lack of effort. Um, this is a classic lecture by Chuck Motel uh, where he talks about his odyssey in the land of small tumors. As you can see on the table on the right, there's been numerous agents that were studied, uh, but these chemotherapy agents uh, did not really have that much activity with the exception of uh, DTIC and streptozocin in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. Another thing you'll see is that, that because you know, this disease was thought to be rare, and he, he, that's why he used the, the, the term land of small tumors, the studies were actually very small. And I think that really limited uh, the, the progress. Uh, these were all single arm studies and some of them only containing less than a handful of patients. <clears throat> so one of the first things I think we needed to understand about neuroendocrine tumors is that the disease is probably actually more common than we think. 
uh, one of the analysis we did in, in from the SEER database, uh, and we showed that comparing to other malignant neoplasms, the diagnosed incidence of neuroendocrine tumor is continually rising. And since this, we have a kind of updated the data. And uh, in you know when when it was in 2004, the incident was about five per hundred thousand. 2012, about uh, seven to um, per hundred thousand. And more data, more recent data we haven't published yet is well above eight per hundred thousand. Another thing that's different about this disease is because the disease is more slow growing, patients live a lot, a lot longer with the cancer. So essentially the prevalence statistic, which is the number of patients who are potentially in need of care because they're alive with disease is actually higher. So if you did limited duration prevalence analysis, which we did from the SEER data, it, uh, in the U.S. prevalence last we looked was above 170,000. So certainly, uh, this is still at least for the moment below the 200,000 cutoff, which the FDA uses this definition of rare disease. And certainly, if you further divide neuroendocrine tumor into its subtypes, they will remain rare for quite a quite a long time. So one of the questions to think about is, uh, with this rise in incidence and so forth, is what's going on here? Are there environmental factors that are increasing the incidence of neuroendocrine tumor? Or perhaps this is just better recognition of the disease. Certainly, we are seeing more neuroendocrine tumors, uh, in some cases related in, in the gastric neuroendocrine tumor, so related to use of PPIs. Uh, but I think for the most part, these neuroendocrine tumor has always been there. So here are a couple of classic studies in two in, in, in carcinoid tumors. So really talking about intestinal neuroendocrine tumors there are two studies that included 15,000 autopsies. And uh, these tumors are found in about 1% of autopsies. So these are patients who die from unrelated causes and most, mostly lived out their natural lifespan without having them diagnosed. So really the question is not so much uh, whether they're increasing in, in what are the environmental factors, but what transforms some of these benign small tumor into malignant ones. For pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, there's one study uh, that was done in Hong Kong, again, 11,000 autopsy, one in 1,000. Uh, autopsy specimen had a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor if you looked for them. Uh, compare this to a diagnosed instance, more like in the range of maybe three to five per million per year. That tells you probably less than 1% of uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors uh, that are present in, in, in patients eventually become clinically relevant. This is posing a challenge for us as we move forward because the increased use of uh, imaging. Nowadays, you can hardly go to the ER with abdominal pain without leaving the ER with a CT scan. So we're finding a lot of small, tiny pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, some of them in the head of pancreas, where if you try to operate on them, may, may, may be a quite a morbid and high-risk procedure. So understanding which of these can be left alone and uh, patients are gonna essentially live with, with disease in their natural lifespan, which one is near to near that really needs to intervene on is going to be important going forward. So the other thing that the with you know this information about the incidence and prevalence in your endocrine tumors uh, is that the patient advocacy groups uh, you know in the past decades has really got engaged. Uh, there are these stories of patients who have had long history of symptom, maybe that went undiagnosed for decades. So there's a, there was a drive to see whether we can recognize the symptoms earlier and diagnose the cancer earlier. But the challenge is the symptoms that are associated with these tumors are fairly uh, vague and common in the general population. So this is a study we did from SEER Medicare database essentially looked at the year prior to their neuroendocrine cancer diagnosis, uh, what kind of doctor did they go visit, and what sort of uh, symptoms did they complain of. 
you can see, well, statistically significant for most of these, there are differences in rates of hypertension, abdominal pain, uh, heart failure, diarrhea, and peripheral edema. But if you try to look at a positive predictive value of these symptoms when you're in the crinic tumor, they're all very, very low because they're very common in the uh, general population. The neuroendocrine field also is a field where the very terminology we which we use the, to describe the disease has been evolving in the, in, in the, over the past decades. Uh, in the older time frame, the words like carcinoid, uh, eyeless cells were commonly used, and uh, it's moved to neuroendocrine neoplasms. And uh, there's grading, initially just grade one and two, and now differentiation is added. To add a historical context on why the, the constant change almost feels like in terminology is that uh, this field, you know, at the time when these terminologies classification created um, was relatively, I think people didn't really know where the right cutoff is in, in terms of the disease. It's more based on consensus and recurrence than really the uh, true biology. What well, beginning to understand is clearly uh, there's two different group of diseases, uh, well differentiated neuroendocrine tumor, grade one, two, and three, and they're mostly grade one, two numerically. And then the uh, essentially the poorly differentiated neuroendocrine carcinomas, which is a completely different disease that has nothing to do with the other, right? And there are also differences in terms of uh, the primary site. We'll talk a little bit about the molecular landscape and genomics of the different primary sites, uh, but they are characterized by relatively low tumor mutational burden. But these tumor actually has high, chromos high rates of chrom chromosomal instability. You see instead of um, point mutations, a large scale chromosomal changes. Uh, lung neuroendocrine tumor, the most common mutation you see is MEM1. And the same with pancreas, MEM1, but here you also see DAX and ATRX. And uh, intestinal, uh, relatively few somatic mutations, uh, but you see frequent loss of chromosome 18. The poorly differentiated neuroendocrine tumor is probably really a mixed bag. Uh, a lot of time, these are essentially transformed versions of adenocarcinoma occasionally transform lower grade tumor after certain types of therapy, uh, but they're characterized by a very fast growth rate and mutation in TP53 and RB are the most common mutations. So to understand the genomics of neuroendocrine tumors, one of the things we did is leverage our large phase three clinical trials. Uh, we did a series of trials called RADIAN trials, uh, looking at Everolimus where about, over about a thousand patients across um, you know, four studies were, were enrolled. And where we can get the tumor, we did a uh, whole genome uh, uh, analysis. Uh, we saw relatively few uh, somatic mutations, but what, what is striking is the amount of large scale chromosomal changes uh, that you see, chromosomal gain and chromosomal loss. And these actually have very significant prognostic value. So for example, in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, patients with high chromosomal instability actually have a much better prognosis in the advanced disease setting. And we'll talk about a little bit uh, in the next few slides why that is, because it is a specific uh, you know, carcinogenesis uh, pathway that uh, this, this is implying here. And then we see also uh, those patients with intestinal neuroendocrine tumor with loss of chromosome 18 also have a far better prognosis than those who do not have a loss of chromosome 18. Whereas a loss of chromosome three, um, the lung neuroendocrine tumors pertains to a poor prognosis. So one of the things that really always short struck uh, me is really what's going on with pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. It's really one of my favorite diseases in the sense there's so much, uh, so much stuff here. So you see here, when we sequence the pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, they roughly fall into three categories when you look at the whole, uh, whole genome in terms of chromosomal changes. 
in the first group here, group one, they lose one copy of 11 of the 22 chromosomes. Uh, in the second group, there's loss of one copy of 11 chromosomes, uh, 11, uh, one copy of 11 chromosomes, and gain on the complementary 11 uh, chromosomes. And then there's a group that are relatively stable in terms of chromosomal abnormalities. And on the bottom panel, it's a little small, so I'll just uh, talk through it a little bit. And it's important in the sense that you can actually link these chromosomal changes to specific mutations that are present. In 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 if you look at this, the chromosomal instability uh, tumors, so the that's these that are in gray and in red, are essentially are enriched for patients with MEM1 mutations. So what's the link between MEM1 mutation and, uh, and this? And the MEM1 mutations is also linked with DAX mutations. Uh, whereas the ATRX mutations uh, uh, essentially also involved in ATRX and DAX are involved in alternative linear telomeres uh, can be associated with chromosomal in, uh, instability in absence of MEM1. So the ATRX by itself, the mutation seems to drive this phenomenon. So, so, so what we see here is and you see DAX and ATRX mutations associated with chromosomal instability, and you have a you know, loss of one copy of 11 chromosome and gain on the complementary 11 chromosomes. And the strong association between MEN1 mutation and DAX in the combination of MEN1 and DAX mutation with chromosome instability. So what's going on here? Why are we losing one copy of 11 chromosome and gaining on the complementary uh, 11 chromosomes? Uh, for whatever reason, you're essentially what's actually going on is you're losing one copy of 11 chromosomes. And this in some patients probably due to haploinsufficiency is leading to whole genome duplication. Uh, so essentially, uh, th these are copy neutral LOH that are occurring, uh, essentially in the gain, uh, because of the whole genome duplication is occurring in the complementary 11 chromosomes. So what's the story here? Well, the most common mutation in uh, neuroendocrine tumor is MEN1, specifically linked to pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors occurring in roughly about 40% of patients and also associated with lung neuroendocrine tumors. What do we know about MEN1 biology? It is certainly is a epigenetic regulator. It's involved in modulating T27 and it's actually involved in controlling endocrine mass. So this is a study done at Stanford uh, where uh, the group looked at men and uh, in, in mice uh, doing pregnancy. And you can see that menin expression goes down during pregnancy and goes back up post-pregnancy. Associated with that is turning on cell cycle and uh, increase in endocrine mass. And uh, so there's a, you know, there's important biology here in prevention of gestational diabetes related to um, menin. Menin turns out is also an important regulator of telomeres. Um, in the nurses, uh, in, in the uh, um, prostate, lung, colorectal, ovarian cancer screening trial and nurses' health study that involved about 3,600 patients, the group, uh, this group evaluated 743 SNPs and tried to correlate that with essentially peripheral blood telomere lens. The only gene that fell out to be important was actually menin. It was the most important uh, implicated in control of telomere lens uh, for, um, for in, in the study. So the story of telomeres, um, you know, as you know, the telomeres are in the caps and end of our chromosomes. And menin is driving cell cycle in the, here the telomere lens is going to get short. As telomere lens gets short, essentially, either the, the cancer cell dies 
where it needs to turn around some way of maintenance uh, of telomere or lengthening of telomeres. For most cancers, this is essentially activation of telomerase. But in a few cancers and in, in pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors, the mechanism that gets, uh, gets, uh, gets um, activated is alternative lengthening of telomeres. How do we know this? Uh, this is uh, some slides courtesy of uh, uh, Christopher Heafy, where he showed essentially in a uh, neuroendocrine tumor that has wild type DAX ATRX, uh, you see fairly normal telomere lengths. And when there is um, uh, DAX or ATRX alterations, you see these bright pink spots, which are telomere specific fish showing a classic pattern associated with um, uh, alternative lengthening of telomeres. The story on uh, essentially alternative lensing telomeres and DAX and ATRX mutations is actually complex in terms of prognosis. Earlier on, I showed you a slide where essentially the, the uh, mutation of DAX, ATRX, and, um, and a turning out ELT was associated with good prognosis in patients with advanced pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. The situation is actually reverse in earlier disease. Essentially what's going on is that in advanced disease, um, the, the DAX ATRX mutation is marking a group of uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor who goes down a very specific carcinogenic pathway. Uh, whereas in, in the earlier disease, this actually the, uh, it pretends to be a worse prognosis. So this is a great study that was done in men one families. So these are patients um, with familial mutations in MEM1. What they're able to show is that when the tumors are small, uh, you usually don't see DAX ATRX mutations. And the DAX ATRX mutations occurs in tumors that are larger. Um, in this case, and I think they use a cutoff of about three centimeters and also happens in patients who have lymph nodal metastasis. So likely uh, uh, what's going on is that uh, as the, these tumor uh, are driven by MEN1 to proliferate these benign tumors, the telomeres are getting shorter uh, and the ones who are able to turn on telomere maintenance through ELT are the ones that gets larger and then uh, lead to regional metastasis. <clears throat> so again, this is uh, just showing the same in terms of a, uh, um, in a recurrence-free survival graph, <laughs> those who are turning on ELT in the lo localized setting where they have three section have a little bit um, poor prognosis. <clears throat> Uh, next, I'm going to shift gear a little bit and talk about essentially on the clinical side, the development uh, of new th novel therapies for neuroendocrine tumors. So essentially, in, prior to 2007, we only had streptozoacin for neuroendocrine tumor of the pancreas. And since then, you really have seen a lot of new agents uh, showing activity, getting FDA approved who are having positive phase three trials. And I think a key thing here that happened really related to uh, one of the meetings in Pam you were involved with was the first uh, in, in a CTPM meeting sponsored by NCI. And the importance of that meeting is really to come to consensus, what is the right kind of clinical trial design for neuroendocrine tumors? What are the correct endpoints? There's a recognition uh, progression-free survival is probably the right endpoint, for, uh, in, but the phase three trials are, are recommended. Overall survival trials in neuroendocrine tumors, uh, we gamed that out in doing the meeting and realized they will require uh, probably about two to 3,000 patients and probably eight to 10 years to execute. So um, that, that's why you will see in the subsequent slide, most of the approved agents 
are able to then demonstrate PFS benefit, but we don't have quite the large sample size needed to demonstrate survival benefit. Um, going going into this, the systemic randomized phase three trials are, you know, we, we were gonna talk them a little bit about different uh, targets. Uh, so the first targets we'll talk about is the semestan receptor. Uh, for a long time prior to this, uh, semestan receptor targeting with octreotide was approved for control of carcinoid syndrome. It relieved flushing and diarrhea in probably about 70% of the patients. But there were a lot of back and forth debate as to whether actually or not it slowed cancer growth. And it was almost like a little religion. People either believe it or we, they, they didn't. But what was important is you just need to actually do the trial, it turns out. And in this phase three trial uh, that's done by the uh, a, a multi-center German trial in, in patients who were relatively newly diagnosed with um, uh, neuro, small bowel neuroendocrine tumor, they were able to demonstrate improvement in progression-free survival. Uh, a similar trial was Lan Realty was conducted. It's a larger trial. Uh, and included a broader group of patients, including pancreatic and rectal neuroendocrine tumors. And again, showing significant benefit in terms of progression-free survival. Notice, however, the hazard ratio for the octreotide study was a little bit lower than the hazard ratio for the landreotide study. This is probably a, by, a byproduct in terms of the way the tri trial were executed. It turns out uh, the octreotide study was PROMED terminated early at interim analysis. And uh, in, there's been subsequent um, publications in analyzing analysis of popula population of studies that can demonstrate while you, when you terminate a study early for outstanding efficacy, you tend to overestimate the, the magnitude of the treatment effect. And that's just a um, you know, a byproduct of an early termination because when you terminate a study early, you preserve your ability to test the hypothesis, but not the ability to estimate the magnitude of treatment benefit. Another way to term uh, to target mass and receptor is uh, PRRT, which really has um, become very uh, you know widely used at this point. Uh, again, in the earlier development of PRRT, it was uh, not it was a lot of a single uh, single institution studies. And you have these publications in high impact journals where they purportedly report a phase two study of a thousand patients. Um, and you know, but actually, what was needed for really demonstrating benefit and approval is a randomized phase three trial which you can do actually with far fewer than 1,000 patients. So this takes advantage of the fact that somastan receptors are present on neuroendocrine cancer cells in 70, 80% of the cases. Specifically for somastan receptor two, when the uh, ligand binds to the receptor is internalized. So, so these agents essentially takes a uh, lutetian-177 and take it into the cell uh, leading to uh, very good efficacy. Uh, there's also a role for a targeted therapy in neuroendocrine tumors. Uh, one of the drugs that we were involved in developing is uh, Everolimus or Finitor, uh, targeting the mTOR pathway. The RADIAN-3 trial uh, was the first to report out in, uh, for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. And here you saw a benefit in progression-free survival from median 4.6 months to 11 months. And the hazard ratio was 0.35 here. Uh, in overall survival, because the crossover, uh, we did RPFST analysis, rank preserving structure failure time, showing like there's a likely benefit in overall survival, but because of the, um, the crossover, these studies, none of these studies are really designed to evaluate overall uh, survival. For radian 4, this is the phase 3 study we did uh, in lung and GI neuroendocrine tumors. Again, uh, patients were randomized to receive everolimus or uh, placebo. 
the um, the 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 PFS improved from 3.9 months to 11 months with a hazard ratio of 0 0.48 and a trend to our overall survival benefit. Another targeted agent that's uh, shown benefit is sunitinib. So sunitinib was initially evaluated in a phase two study that had two cohorts uh, for intestinal neuroendocrine tumors and for pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. All the responses were seen in the pancreatic neuroendocrine group. So it was taken into a phase three trial. Uh, the study actually terminated early at an unplanned interim analysis. Nonetheless, there was significant benefit demonstrating PFS, and then uh, that led to the FDA uh, approval of the drug uh, for pancreatic uh, neuroendocrine tumors. We do believe VEGF inhibitors may have a role in uh, extra pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor as well. Uh, this is a, another phase three trial that I did early in my career, uh, the SWOT 0518. And uh, the, in this study, patients were randomized from uh, octreotide plus interferon versus octreotide plus bevacizumab. What we were able to show in this study is that although the response rate improved with bevacizumab and toxicity was better with bevacizumab, uh, there was not any significant difference in progression-free survival. So this is probably one of my regrets in the career. I probably should have done this study against placebo, and we would have had, had another drug uh, available for um, neuroendocrine much earlier on. Uh, this is about the time point in my career where we weren't sure whether we can execute a placebo control trial. It's certainly a little bit harder to do, but often placebo control trial give you cleaner data, especially when the comparator arm is not uh, is not very carefully well. It's not uh, well defined. So there has been others who um, uh, evaluated VEGF inhibitors in neuroendocrine tumor. Uh, this is a study conducted also in the co cooperative group. Uh, the PI is uh, Emily Berkslin, and uh, patients were randomly assigned to either pizopinib versus placebo. And uh, there, uh, there was the benefit in terms of progression-free survival, also demonstrated in extra pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. So uh, potentially uh, showing the importance and role of VEGF inhibitor outside beyond the pancreatic uh, group. In terms of phase three studies for uh, uh, extra pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, uh, and uh, there's also a study that was performed in two studies that were performing in China uh, with surfactant, another VEGF um, uh, or multi-kinase inhibitor, uh, demonstrating similar magnitude of benefit for uh, surfactant, both in pancreatic net and extra pancreatic net. Unfortunately, the uh, FDA uh, is going to probably require the, the company to redo the trial because it did not contain it was a purely um, a Chinese population, and the population may not fully represent the lines of prior therapy Western populations would have been exposed to. Next, I'm going to mention well Dr. Kunz's trial, uh, ECOG 2211. This is actually a, a very important trial, partially because the initial development of uh, timazolomide were essentially skipped the single agent step. Um, they were, you know, most of the trials that were published were doublets. So always been a question in the field that whether you need doublets or you, you know, or the agent is um, uh, timazolomide by itself is uh, sufficient. Certainly there's rationale to look at this class of agents in uh, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors. If you dig back into Chuck Montero's uh, papers and so forth. Uh, DTIC is active in the disease. So this is a trial that compared timazolomide to TIM-CAPE. At uh, the internal analysis, uh, the study uh, met its primary endpoint and showed uh, improvement in progression-free survival for our patients uh, with uh, TIM-CAPE. And I think another actually very important finding from this study is the prognostic and uh, significance with association uh, of the 
MGMT uh, expression was the response. Um, and this is a DNA repair pathway when it, that often are methylated, uh, MGMT, and leading to low expression. And you can see that for patients with low MGMT, the response rate is much higher than those who have intact MGMT expression. So if you look at current treatment landscape for neuroendocrine tumor, we have come a long way. Uh, you know, in the beginning, historically, we only had one agent for pancreatic net. Now you have a number of phase three clinical trial covering many of the different uh, neuroendocrine tumors. Essentially, these are clustered around uh, agents that targets either stable or early disease like Triotai and Lanriotai in the PROMIT and the Clarinet study. And uh, in the studies who tend to target patients with faster progressing disease. Uh, PRT somewhere in the middle that required progression in the past three years. And most of the targeted agents require progression in the past one year, when in the case of radian four, progression within the past six months. So what are some of the remaining challenges and questions that uh, we, we have for neuroendocrine tumor uh, at this point? One of the questions I get asked the most is sequencing. What's the optimal sequencing of uh, therapy for neuroendocrine tumors? So it's kind of interesting because neuroendocrine tumors, you had approval of a lot of agents all in a short period span of time. So they were not really developing a way where uh, they were specific uh, line, first line, second line, or third line. Most of the drugs were either approved for progressive disease or they were just approved for advanced disease. Uh, but optimal sequencing is really talking about which sequence leads to the best overall long-term survival. This is actually an extremely difficult question to answer. It's not about which agent uh, when used first has the longest initial PFS, because if that agent, you know, essentially takes out your kidney or uh, uh, makes it difficult for you to receive other agents, then it may not be the best agent to use initially. So almost certainly this is, if you really want to answer this question, it needs an overall survival endpoint. Well, here's the challenge, right? When uh, for different indications, you have different number of uh, treatments available. Um, the approved therapy for lung, there's only Everolimus. In PNAT, you have six agents that are available, approved, you can use. A seventh agent's demonstrated activity uh, that uh, that's probably works. Well, you can imagine trying to compare optimal sequences. There's 5,040 sequences. 5,040 arms for overall survival. This is not where we want to spend our energy. And because I think likely before even if you solve a simpler question, before you actually answer the question and complete the trial, the treatment landscape would have changed and the trial design will probably no longer be uh, valid. And to give a actually example of an attempt to do this, our European colleague, conduct the, the sequitor trial. The sequitor trial looked look to compare the sequence of Everolimus followed by streptozosin-based chemotherapy or streptozosin-based chemotherapy followed by Everolimus. They weren't going to be quite ambitious to try uh, OS as the primary endpoint. They were going to look at PFS2 so, uh, initially. However, due to accrual issues, uh, they had to do uh, scale back their ambitions to look at PFS1 as the primary endpoint. So what did the study show? Um, it actually showed that although uh, streptozosin cytotoxic chemotherapy uh, was a little bit more toxic, but higher, had a higher response rate, but there was no difference in progression-free survival between the two arms. So higher, higher response rate may not necessarily lead uh, to a better outcome. The second most frequent question I get asked about neuroendocrine tumor these days is precision medicines and biomarkers. If you did a search 
on neuroendocrine tumor and biomarkers on PubMed, and you'll get thousands, probably near 10,000 results back. So what do we know about biomarkers for neuroendocrine uh, tumors? I usually think about biomarkers as two classes. These are prognostic, identifying those people who have uh, a better or worse outcome, and predictive, meaning to actually sorting out uh, individual who are more likely than similar individual without a biomarker to experience a favorable or unfavorable benefit from an exposure to a medical product with environmental agents. So the bottom line is who should get this treatment is really the, the important question for a predictive biomarker. Another way to think about the importance of predictive biomarker is really uh, thinking about like who's gonna benefit from treatment. If you have a treatment where everybody benefits, predictive biomarker can almost become essentially a prognostic biomarker. It's probably of less clinical importance. In the situation where half the patient will benefit, a, a predictive biomarker is super useful. And it's even more important when a smaller group of patients have profound benefit, but most people don't. So what is actually the situation in neuroendocrine tumor? Which of these waterfall plots do we look like? Fortunately, it looks like this, with uh, most of the patients uh, benefiting from the treatment uh, within their treatment indications. So the challenge of predictive biomarker is essentially you have to randomize more patient, uh, all patients, in including patients who doesn't have the biomarker, because without uh, that randomization, it's very difficult to understand which biomarker is uh, important. You should do this when the marker is suspected to be predictive but not proven, and you have reliable assay um, methodology and cut points, and there's reason to express, re, uh, expect benefit potentially in biomarker negative patients. Much more uh, common we see in oncology these days is this approach, which is establishing a efficacy in a biomarker population, which means we only essentially randomize the biomarker positive population. So here you can prove the biomarker positive benefit, uh, patients benefit from new treatment, uh, but it's best used when no benefit is expected in bio ne biomarker negative population. You don't have any information gained about the biomarker negative population. But often sometimes we get it wrong, right? We, we don't initially fully understand this. The classic example in colon cancer is cetuximab. The initial FDA approval in clinical trial was for patients who had EGFR exp uh, expression on IHC. Turns out that has nothing to do with whether someone benefits from uh, cetuximab or not in colorectal cancer. And the net example is really kind of something I kind of lived through. Um, after we started the phase three trial, a publication came out in Science showing about 15% of the patients with pancreatic net and mTOR pathway mutations. So I, 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 will, I will gladly admit I was very lucky not to know that when I started the trial, but because it turns out, um, you know, extra pancreatic net, none of the patients have mTOR pathway mutations, called mTOR pathway mutations but they all benefited from the therapy. And even in the pancreatic net group, those who had mTOR pathway mutations and didn't have mTOR pathway mutation have similar magnitude of benefit. That's not to say that it's not uh, correct that you know, what, you know, what was published, it just means that I don't think we may sometimes know the full mTOR pathway or how these drugs actually work. Other biomarkers in uh, neuroendocrine trials, uh, the question often is asked about the somatostatin so scintigraphy in, uh, for uh, somatostatin like, like octreotide or lanreotide. The PROMIS study actually allowed for both somatostatin receptor scintigraphy positive and negative patients, but negative, the number of negative patients that were treated 
were too few to allow for any sort of meaningful analysis. And clarinet study uh, only treated patients who were uh, somatostatin receptor positive. This one comes close to a predictive biomarker, which is the degree of uptake and response in tumor shrinkage uh, in, in, in for treatment with a peptide receptor radiotherapy. As you can see that comparing to the, using the Krenin scale, as the expression goes up, the response rate uh, increase compared uh, for peptide receptor radiotherapy. Another biomarker that was evaluated is, uh, is more like a pharmacodynamic biomarker. Uh, in early uh, studies, in single arm study, it looked like those patients who had an early drop in chromogranin A had a benefit for patients uh, uh, treated with everolimus. But this turned out actually not to be that useful when we took it to phase three, because the placebo patient who had a 30% drop in chromogranin A also ha had a better outcome as well. So likely this is pointing out some issues with the assay performance and also whether or not you actually have to test these patients multiple times before you get a reliable results. Another biomarker attempting to look at uh, predictive uh, biomarker in terms of response is looking at perfusion CT in patients treated with VEGF inhibitors. We're able to show that in patients treated with bevacizumab, pazopin, and aflibercept, that uh, essentially baseline parameter and change after treatment correlated with the degree of tumor shrinkage. I think uh, what we learned here is that these are very difficult to do and very operator dependent. So it's, while it's possible to do it in a clinical trial, taking it out to the wider clinical practice is challenging. So if you look at the biomarker uh, landscape for neuroendocrine tumor, you, you will see that in terms of understanding uh, whether the treatment work in the, uh, in, in the indication, we do pretty well. Uh, whereas predictive biomarkers, there are a few promising ones like uh, Brennan scale for uh, PRT and MGMT for uh, temozolomide. Uh, however, we still need a lot, lot more work to do in terms of getting real predictive uh, biomarkers. So I mentioned earlier that we have a lot of approved therapy, but most of these trials were not designed to ask a survival question. Uh, so, you know, has all this work been approval? Are patients doing better? Uh, we can look back into the SEER database again and showing that uh, the trend in improving, improving overall survival uh, in patients with grade one to two metastatic neuroendocrine tumors suggesting that what we did actually does actually make a real impact. So next, uh, what do we think we need to do to continue the progress uh, in neuroendocrine tumors? I think clearly we, one thing we learned is the use of robust randomized clinical trials. And we shouldn't be shy about using placebo control trial in the right setting. We do need better availability of neuroendocrine model for translational research. I think we have a baseline group of therapy that works now uh, to find the next pathway to target. The next target, uh, I think the, the neuro models in the lab will really benefit us. And uh, we need to obviously explore novel therapeutic approaches. I'll just have two more slides on the modeling part. So, there's a real challenge with developing models for well-differentiated neuroendocrine tumors. There's been many uh, attempts to generate cell lines, single graphs, and organoids. Uh, principally, they are limited by the slow growing nature of the tumor. So if you think about it, in placebo arm of clinical trial, you see these tumors uh, takes about somewhere between five to 18 months median to show about a 20% increase in diameter. If you really had a representative model, one, those models are very difficult to keep alive. Second, it will take you years to run one single experiment in the lab. So it's, it's very, very, very challenging. There are models out there, but many of them are altered in such a fundamental way that I don't think they represent neuroendocrine biology. 
So if you look at the published cell lines in, um, in, in the, the you know, models out there, many of them highlighting yellow have mutation that do not occur naturally in well-differentiated nets with P53 and RB. Uh, the remaining usually are unknown in terms of P53 RB status. So here's the conundrum. You need a model that grows fast enough to actually take and can generate enough material that you can actually do experiments, uh, but you still need to represent a, the, the neuroendocrine slow growing biology. So how do we tackle this? One of the efforts we've been doing uh, in our lab is using a genetically engineered patient-derived organoid models. So what are we doing here? We know that if you alter P53 RB, these, these things will grow and take and proliferate. But you don't want the P53 RB um, you know, altered when you're testing, studying new drugs, or understanding the, uh, the biology of nets. So we are using a lentiviral vector to introduce essentially doxycycline-inducible uh, alterations in key proliferation pathways. So the idea is you essentially put in a growth on and off switch into the patient tumor samples. And then you control it with, uh, in this case, doxycycline uh, we're using either SV40 large T antigen behind a um, the uh, be behind the promoter, or a altered P53R273, uh, because the P53 acts as a tetramer when even one copy is uh, is actually mutated, it impairs its function. Still a lot of work to do to figure this out because there are many different variations you can do this. You can directly infect the, the primary uh, cells. You can grow them in organoids and infect the organoids and what's the right condition and uh, how does all this work. We're happy to show that we're making progress that we can actually use the system to make uh, neuroendocrine uh, tumor organoids grow. Uh, because the previous attempts at organoids, while you can use growth factor to keep them alive, they don't really grow. So the only way you can study them is to have a constant stream of material coming from the operating room, but each time is a little bit different, right? So we're hoping that um, over the next uh, you know, months to year to fully characterize all the, uh, these organoids that we're developing in terms of um, what, what is uh, staying the same, what is being altered, and to what extent we can reverse the P53 and, and, uh, and uh, SV40 induced uh, changes when we show all the doxycycline to do drug screening or study the biology. So I'm gonna end the talk here and have maybe just a few minutes for questions. Oh, you, can, you can stay up there. Um, any questions from the audience or from or online? Maybe one. Let's see if anyone in the chat. Um, I'll, I'll ask the first question. What are you most excited about from a therapeutic standpoint in the next decade? That's a tough question. Um, you know, I, I, I think there's still a role for immunotherapy, but probably not in, with existing checkpoint inhibitors but maybe within us, um, except for maybe subpopulations. Because one of the things we're learning is, although tumor, tumor mutational burden is generally low, neuroendocrine patients live a long time. So that tumor mutational burden actually may change over time. If you look late in the course of the disease, you may find um, you know, patients will benefit from those, those sort of treatment. Especially interesting is like your work with temozolomide, right? Mm -hmm. Because these are agents that tend to induce tumor mutations and, and may increase tumor mutation burden. So that's actually, I think, a relevant sequencing question. You use that early, does that mean later on they have a high TMB and you can go back with IO? Right. That sort of things. Yeah. Good question. Yeah, Kevin. 
Thanks, Dr. Yowie. Can you comment, um, given the expanding armamentarium and systemic agents, where you see the evolving role of surgical therapy fitting in with this disease? And it's complicated historically, depending on where you are and who you work with, what the landscape is. And we have felt like surgical cyto reduction has a role in this disease, but I I don't know that that's as much the case in the current era or it will be in the future. I, I think that's a great question. I think there still will be an important role for cyto reduction in surgery in this disease. Uh, if nothing, it actually gives the patient uh, potentially a long treatment-free interval from systemic therapy. And uh, although the time course here is long, so metastatic small bowel patients are living eight to 10 years. Um, but if you ask the patient, they will say eight to 10 years is not enough, right? So I think there's still room to use multiple modality, including surgery and interventional radiology technique and so forth. You know, the, the surgery of symptoms? It certainly can. Um, I mean, yeah, you know, there's many different ways it can. In, you know, some cases, uh, patients have uh, essentially abdominal discomfort from a local tumor with nodes, and the surgical resection or bypass can be very important for them, even though palliative. And patients who have um, severe carcinoma syndrome, sometimes refractory therapy, and benefit from debulking all types. Um, should there's an increase in incidence but also survival, are you able to kind of differentiate increased you know, diagnosis of otherwise endowed tumors versus advances in therapy? Are you able to kind of you know, parse those out? Yeah, so I, I think one of the ways we're looking at the survival changes is limiting our analysis to those with metastatic disease. There are still very much some limitations when you look at that sort of data. Uh, but I think the large registry is probably still the best way to look at the survival data. Because when you look at individual institutions, you have a lot of referral bias. You know, those patients who have surgery are cured, they don't come to tertiary centers, right? They're going on and living their normal lives. And uh, so the large registry still have a very important role there. Uh, and the increase in incidence is happening in distinct areas uh, like rectal is you know, because the screening colonoscopy, you're finding a lot of tiny uh, rectal neuroendocrine tumors, which also is linked to specific uh, race and ethnicity issues. And uh, in, in, in small pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, it's gonna be something we're gonna have to deal with, it's just the increased CT start getting done. Great, well, thank you so much, Dr. Yao, for coming today.